morning, it's 10 a.m. right here in Lagos, Nigeria. Good morning, good evening. Wherever in the world you're watching from, is this Business Morning uh, live on Channels Television. It's great to have you uh, join us. I'm Ladi Williams. Let's kick off your morning now with the oil markets. We see oil prices posted gains uh, more than 1% in Asia trade today on a falling U.S. crude inventories and a lower greenback. But concerns, uh, OPEC Plus will leave output unchanged at its uh, upcoming meeting and a weak China data, also limited gains. Futures, uh, Brent crude, uh, crude futures firmed at 95 cents to $83.98 a barrel in early trade, while U.S. WTI crude futures uh, climbed by 80 cents, or 1.02% to $79 uh, dollars per barrel, helping to boost prices. U.S. crude oil stocks were expected to have dropped by about 7.9% a million barrels in this week uh, ending uh, for November, according to market sources uh, citing American Petroleum uh, Institute figures. Uh, gasoline inventories rose by about 2.9 million barrels, while distillate stocks were seen rising about 4.0 uh, million barrels, according to, the, uh, according to sources who spoke uh, out of anonymity in the market there and uh, also analyst uh, uh, expectations showing uh, right there. A global investment uh, bank, uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, says the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries is very likely to cut oil production in a bid to stem a price decline and balance the market. This forecast comes amid fears of a recession and uh, weakening crude demand in China. The bank further notes that its uh, medium-term oil outlook for 2023 was very positive and it sees uh, prices rise to 110 uh, dollars per barrel. In October, OPEC Plus had agreed to uh, reduce crude production by about 2 million barrels per day uh, from November. Meanwhile, OPEC Plus is set to uh, convene in Vienna, Austria, on December the 4th to decide the next phase of production policy. We'll see if Goldman Sachs uh, forecast there actually stands. Well, back here, the Central Bank of Nigeria says a total of $4.98 million has been uh, repatriated into the country by non-oil exporters in nine months higher uh, than the uh, $4.19 billion uh, received in the full year 2021. The CBN governor made this known at the second biannual RT200 non-oil non export summit in Lagos. According to Mr. Amifile, the bank has paid 81 billion naira in rebates to hardworking Nigerian exporters of finished and semi-finished goods. Do take a listen. This $81 billion, billion naira we have paid so far is a testament to the resolve of the CBN to ensure quick acceleration of the export value chain in the country. I know that there have been calls to make all exporters eligible or export products eligible for this rebate and not just limiting it to finished and semi-finished products. While we see some justification for this call, one of the goals of the RT200 program is to help quicken the process of industrialization and encourage exporters earn more from their export businesses. We must help our exporters and our economy by adding value to what we produce and export. The CBN is committed to strengthening and expanding foreign exchange supply into the market. All right, now to our first conversation. According to the Nigeria Multidimensional Poverty Index 2022 survey, uh, there are high uh, deprivations in sanitation, time to healthcare, food insecurity, and uh, housing uh, deficits. Also, poor people are said to experience over one quarter of all possible uh, deprivations. And their calls for action, if Nigeria is to achieve the targeted sustainable uh, development goals for national development. But let's... Uh, talk about it from a sub-national level. Let's talk to Sholakwe Hammond now, Special Advisor to Lagos State Governor on SDGs and Investments. Join us via Zoom. Great to have you on the program. Thank you. Wish I could be there this morning, but thanks for having me. No, it's fine. Uh, seeing how the traffic is so bad with all the fuel queues uh, we have uh, out there, we'll, we'll just settle uh, for this. But great to have you. Uh, looking at that um, uh, multidimensional uh, poverty report, there are 133 million uh, Nigerians. It's, uh, it's a big number, and it's making the SDGs, you know, uh, getting those goals look more like a mirage. How are you seeing it? 
So, of course, it's, it's certainly a cause for concern. Um, and it's really not entirely unexpected. I think the entire world is probably doing a lot uh, poorer on this in terms of in, indeed regressing, not making progress. Uh, given what has happened in the last few years, we've had COVID, we've had local and global recessions, we have the tensions in, um, in Europe. It's entirely possible that we haven't even completely uh, started to feel the after effects of that or some of the shock effects of that. Um, and so it's, it's, it's been a very challenging environment. But again, you know, we're very optimistic. We never entirely lose hope. For us, it's really a call to action. And when you look beneath the hood and look at sort of the layers under it, it's, it's clear that there are actions that are being taken that are the steps in the right direction, even if we're not entirely seeing all the results. So for example, if we break down the multi-dimensional poverty index results, if you look at things like neonatal mortality, um, for Lagos, that was 50, 50 deaths per thousand children born in Lagos uh, in 2017 when the initial report came out. Uh, in this last report, it was 15 deaths. Of course, you still don't want to lose any children, but it's shown that there is progress and there's a reason behind that progress. And that's why we can be optimistic. It's not entirely by chance. It's the investments in mother and care, uh, child care facilities, which we've seen have really, really made a difference. There can be specialists there. They're closer to the people and they're focused entirely on ensuring that we address that challenge with neonatal mortality and maternal mortality. So we've gone from two of those in Lagos in 2019 when this administration came into 10. Uh, we're revamping the general hospitals. We've put in place in Lagos, the state health insurance um, scheme. And we're really happy to see the federal government getting behind that and really encouraging that state schemes should be supported. Lagos now has over 650,000 people put on it. And we also have free health care, uh, free health insurance for the poor and vulnerable. What we're doing with all of that is systematically improving the healthcare system going from when you couldn't even trust the primary health care centers and you only had, and you had 70% of the cases in the tertiary institutions being things like malaria and other things that should be handled at primary health care center where you had to pay cash if you went to a private facility. So the situation now where we're beginning to see that insurance take, take shape, the, the capitation that's then required to run both public and private facilities come in. We actually have a, a total of 250 public and private institutions now on the state health insurance. So when you start to see an improvement in healthcare, standardization of healthcare, and a drive to bring in people into healthcare, then you start to see those results. And that's why we can see those numbers improving. So there are numbers that, of course, did not uh, improve. There are some that actually regressed. I think we uh, stunting, we actually increased uh, the rate of stunting by 1% in Lagos. But by and large, with most of those markers, Lagos improved because of systematic, uh, uh, systematic uh, solutions to those things. If you look in the education sector as well, I think a lot of people are already familiar with what's been going on with public schools. The EcoExcel um, technology-enabled learning system that we have now deployed at the primary school level, the revolutions that are happening in e-learning, teacher training, all those inputs, the, the softer things. You may not hear about them the way you hear about the launch of a road, but they're things we're systematically doing, and we're seeing outcomes. So the performance of, private, of public school children in secondary school at WIEC uh, with five credits, one in English, one in math, um, five credits, sorry, five credits, including English and math, it went from 39% in 2020 to 78% in 2021. That's a two-year change, a leap, a doubling in two years. Apparently, if you have five credits with either math or English, it was actually at above percent. So we're seeing outcomes, we're tracking them, and we're seeing the systematic response or the response, the results that are coming as a result of, of those systematic improvements. So uh, talking, about, uh, talking about uh, tr tracking them, how easy or hard is it to, you know, measure the progress? So it takes a lot and you will see it's happening at very different levels. So we have the Ministry of Economic Planning and Budget and the Lagos Bureau of Statistics. Lagos was one of the first subnationals to set up a Bureau of Statistics. And we, we actually have our own uh, household survey that looks at 20,000 households and we track that information. We also have a digital cabinet in place, which many people may not be aware of. The themes agenda that was crafted by Mr. Governor had KPIs that were developed. So that's performances that were developed during the transition committee and are tracked monthly across the entire state. So we have a, a cabinet digital, um, um, digital software that shows us where we are on each of those markers for each of the themes uh, outcomes. So everything from how many bitumen we have that we're producing that enables us to do the roads. People don't understand that you have to look at some of these leading indicators. If you don't have some of these things, you can't even get the outcomes that you're looking for. 
So it's not very easy, but those investments have to be made. We're also very excited that Lagos, as I mentioned, we're, we're part of the multidimensional um, index. Uh, we, we're tracking those um, indices, working with the Human Capital uh, National um, Poor Working Group. We actually held a regional summit last week where we've posted the Southwest states and we looked at this and we came up with strategies to work. And then Lagos is also doing something called a voluntary local review. We started that process. And we're looking to conclude by the first quarter of next year, supported by the Office of the Special, uh, Senior Special Assistant to the President of the SDGs, Princess Ray and the UNDP, to develop our own first voluntary local review that will look at all the work that's been done across the SDGs and actually give us data for as many of those indicators that are relevant to the state, about 161 of them that we'll be tracking. And so we're very, very focused because we know what you don't measure, you can't manage. Right. Well, uh, looking at uh, where we are uh, now, obviously, for, to achieve these goals, you know, you need uh, investments. How do you think, you know, states can attract, you know, more investments at this time? And for us, it's actually been a very interesting story. Overall, FDI, overall foreign direct investment has dropped to Africa uh, since the impact, since the advent of COVID. It actually shrank to about half in Nigeria um, between from 2019 to 2020. It went back up a little bit last year, and it's been kind of middling a bit this year. But for us in Lagos, we've consistently been between 75% and 86% of those investments. And the reason is this. First, the market is here, and we're providing the enabling environment to support but also catalytically seeking those investments. So what we've done in Lagos was we created something called a deal book. We identified 10 sectors that were investable and we helped investors to understand what they were. So agriculture, transportation, healthcare, real estate, which is huge in Lagos, uh, commerce, the industrial hubs, and the technology, all the spaces that are of rele uh, critical relevance for Lagos. And you can see quite a few of them are also enshrined in the 30-year Lagos development plan that we've developed. And we detailed, we gave a, an interesting overview because not everyone's been to Nigeria before. And this is not just for foreign investors, but for local as well. And then we detailed specific investment opportunities. So look at things like the real line. Many people are hearing about the blue line which we've been trying to build for 10 years, which we will now complete by the end of this year and start testing. So we're very excited about that. And the red line, which we're working with federal government on to then start testing on in January. But some are not aware that they're actually six lines planned. And there's a lot of interest now in the green line, which will be all the way from the Lekki Free Zone and Ekwe back also into Marina to join the interchange for the red and the blue line. So from those three parts of the state you can connect, that's in the deal book. The power for that is in the deal book. The Lekki Free Zone itself, the Badagri Port, the commercial and industrial estates all over Lagos, um, the logistics and market hub which we're building, which is the first of its kind in Africa. Um, so many investment opportunities, the healthcare investment opportunities, uh, we recently, I think middle of the year, completed a process uh, to convert the old nursing state, uh, nursing uh, hostel facility on Aulo Road in Ikoi into a medical park as a private uh, public partnership arrangement. We're talking about the fourth mainland bridge. All of those things are detailed in the deal book. So it makes it easy for people to come and invest. We've also put that deal book essentially online. If you go to our website, lagosstgsandinvestment.com, you will then be able to go and see sector by sector possible investment opportunities and contact us. And we, as the facilitators for Lagos, will then handhold you to work with the various ministries and Office of uh, PPP to deliver on these investments. But, but how so that's are, what we've done in are, Lagos. We've how, also gone out. Yeah, how, how are you know, investors you know, reacting to these investment opportunities? You know, with that uh, FX risk, you know, uh, that's uh, also a big you know, problem for investors. So the foreign policy or the foreign exchange regime has, to be honest, been a bit challenging. We've seen some of the constraints that they've had in the aviation industry. We've seen some of the constraints that manufacturers are having. But the truth is every investment, every investment environment has its own unique challenges. And there are things in place to sort of help to manage those challenges. For Lagos, pragmatically at this point, you want investors who understand Africa, who understand Lagos, who understand that there are some of these challenges which we can help them work through, but who ultimately understand that it is important to be here. Lagos is going to be the economic hub of the Africa continental free trade area. Uh, we're not going to just be a market, we're going to be an export hub. And in spite of those environments, we're seeing not just um, new people interested in coming here, we're seeing existing investors bring in more money. We have um, investors, manufacturers in the food and beverage space, 
who are now looking to make Lagos their regional hub. They're inflowing uh, money here. So it may be challenging, but there are ways that working together with us, working together with the federal government, with the support of the central bank, you can weather those challenges just as you do in any other investment. All right, let's look at uh, MSMEs uh, right now. It's getting more expensive, you know, to do uh, a business uh, right now. We're seeing rising energy costs, you know, rising uh, costs of actually uh, doing business. Uh, how can we, you know, make this uh, a goal a reality with, with this uh, a, a, a stark reality is facing, you know, business owners right now? So that's been an area that we've paid particular attention to and try to address each of their problems. So from a funding perspective and business support, just the technical support of how to successfully run a business, Lagos State Employment Trust Fund has been providing some support in that regard. From uh, where, to, where can they operate from? We actually have something that's very exciting that's happening in our lucky free zone because we realize we can't make it just a zone for large corporate. We have to help the small and medium enterprise enterprises win this uh, continental free trade agreement, this single market game. We want to support our MSMEs to actually become big companies. And so the, in the Lucky Free Zone, we're actually building something called standard factories that enables them to take small spaces and be able to also benefit from the value that you see when you're manufacturing in the free zone. So you get quick and easy clearing and shipping, um, you get some duty waivers, uh, some tax rebates and things like that. And so we have an event, an investment breakfast event, actually, on the 13th of December. So for interested MSMEs, it'll be good for you to be there or at least join us online so that you can understand some of these offerings. We're also running something called a Franchise Framework Development Initiative, where we're targeting working with 300 MSMEs in Lagos in areas that are easy to franchise. So things like um, food, and bev, um, food and beverage, uh, health, uh, healthcare, uh, services, the traditional areas where you have um, cosmetics, where you have um, franchises work. We're working with them to de develop their own franchising model so that they can expand beyond the one location that we typically have in our small businesses in Lagos across the state, across the country, across the continent, and even globally. And we're going to be supporting 20 of them to actually extend, to create 10 franchises in the space of two years. So there's a lot that's very exciting that's happening in Lagos for small and medium businesses. We conducted a policy audit last year where we looked at the policy environment and we started to address some of the issues that are peculiar to MSMEs. So, you know, Lagos is very friendly to MSMEs. We think they're the engine room of growth, then the engine room for job creation. And we think it's extremely important to support them, not just with funding, but with the right environment. And, and the, the, the million dollar question there, how do we reduce inequality? <sighs> so you reduce inequality by creating jobs, by providing skills, by training, and by providing them enablement, giving people a voice and understanding their environment. So part of what we'll be doing when we conduct this voluntary local review is going into some, we've picked out six blighted areas, six areas have what sometimes are referred to as slum communities, and we'll take those people and work with them. So sometimes people think um, Makoko, an area like Makoko is an environmental issue. Sometimes it's not an environmental issue, sometimes it's an economic issue. If you work with them and help them improve the economics of what they're doing, so they're traditionally fisher people, if you help them provide methods for preserving and storing and selling their products. We've heard recently of a young, um, a, a young I think two young brothers who worked with their parents who live in Macapo, who are not fisher people, and they helped them build an app to sell their fish, and they, went, and they quadrupled their sales. When you do that, you provide them the economic wherewithal to be able to improve their environment. If we wanted to build homes for everyone who's in a slum community or who's poor in Lagos, we just couldn't afford to do it. No one can, especially with the rate of migration in Lagos. But if you support them to learn the skills and trade, to pull themselves out, and then they're able to improve their economics, they will then be able to make better decisions and make those investments themselves. So the answer to inequality is job creation and providing the skills and wherewithal for them to be able to then boost themselves out of, out of, out of poverty. All right, so, so much to do there, 133 million, big number. It'd uh, be great to take uh, one step at a time to, to reduce that number. But thank you so much. Uh, that was Sholakwe Hammond, SA to the Lagos State Governor on SDGs and Investments. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you very much for having me.
All right, uh, time for the AFX uh, Commodity Market Update. Now we see uh, for the week ended 28th of November, the AFX Commodity Market Summary uh, was mostly in the green. For more information now, join us is uh, Eniola Kindele, Market Data and Research Analyst at uh, AFX. Uh, great to have you on the program. Good morning. It's good to be here. All right, so give us a rundown of uh, activities at the, on the exchange. Okay, thank you. We saw a bullish performance across our key indicators in the last trading week. Our total turnover increased by 82%, moving from 2 billion era to close at 4 billion era. For our volumes traded, we saw an increase of 98%, moving from 6.9 million to close at 13.7 million. For total number of deals, our total number of deals increased, increased by 33%, moving from 283 deals to close out at 378 deals. Across our key indexes, our commodity index was flat with 455.71 basis points. Our export index, however, increased by our export index, however, increased by 0.57% to close out at 205.35 basis points. For the volumes traded, however, we saw that it Paddy rice, soybean, and maize were responsible for 70% of the increment. For the prices of our commodities, we saw an increase of 0.48%, totaling a, a gain of 1 Nera 68 Kobo to close out at 292 Nera 67 Kobo for soybean. And paddy rice also increases by 2.69%, totaling a gain of 7 Nera 67 Kobo to close out at 292 Nera 67 Kobo. Also, cashew nut increases by 1.82%, totaling a gain of 10 Nera to close out at 560 Nera per kilogram. However, the prices of maize declined by 12.7%, totaling a loss of 32 Nera to close out at 220 Nera. Why the prices of our other commodity were flat? To know more about us, kindly visit our website at africanexchange.com and to trade on our platform, kindly download our app, Comex, on Play Store and iOS Store. Thank you. That was uh, Enola Kindele, the market data and research analyst at AFEX, giving us uh, details for uh, activities on the exchange. Let's take the conversation further now. We see inflation levels have shifted both uh, local and international you know, economic activities, created widespread economic uh, deceleration, and this uncertainty in the global economy has more than ever has created a space for financial market players to take positions in the uh, commodities market and leverage the opportunities available. But are these opportunities still there? Let's talk to uh, Zara Dogona, investment manager, Apex. Uh, join us right there from Abuja studio. Uh, great to have you on the program. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Good morning. Yeah, so it's a, it's a, um, a so major... To answer the question. Yeah, it's a, it's a major concern Go now ahead. currently with inflationary pressures in the country. And, and for so long, we've seen financial advisors emphasize the need for savings and, you know, investments. What do you think should be, you know, practiced more at this time? Um, so without a doubt, I would say investments because, I mean, imagine if you were to take your money to the bank for 10 to 12 months, um, you would have savings as low as, 40, you would have returns as low as 4 to 5 percent compared to a one-year treasury bill that would give you 14 to 15 percent on that. And just narrowing it down to the commodities market, um, AFEX took a product to the market sometime in January. This is the AFEX um, exchange traded commodity. It's matured in September and it did a return of about 24 percent in nine months. So, I mean, when you look at um, those numbers, savings giving you 4 to 5 percent, um, Treasury bills one year giving you 14 to 15 percent, and the AFEX commodities, um, commodities backed instruments giving you 23 to 24 percent. I think you as well can say that investments are definitely better than savings. Right. Investments give more multipliers. But we see the commodities market, you know, outperformed uh, at the beginning of the year, and uh, we, we all know uh, why. And uh, do, do, you see, do you still see opportunity, you know, in the commodities market? Um, so certainly, there is still opportunity in the market. I mean, we are 
um, at the start of the season, which means that we are still in the harvest season. And um, with the harvest season, what you would see is a large influx of commodities into the market, which means that there will be excess supply in the market. And that just technically tells you that it's a good time to position yourself to buy. And um, Apex comes into position here by giving you a platform to buy and sell these commodities um, at reasonable prices and then just watch how those prices go all through the season. All right. Yeah. Well, what what yeah, are the next to take advantage of? All right. Looking at the market now, what do you think? Uh, you know, are the, the risks to look out for? You know, in the next uh, trading season. Um, so I would say price volatility risk is any um, is the risk that any investor should look out for. Um, really because if we don't have a good understanding of the fundamental or technical factors that would affect the market, and this is also what you would see in the equity space, um, it's very easy for you to lose the value of your money. So um, you would need to understand what the market is like, and with that we provide data in terms of um, daily, weekly, monthly and quarterly reports that shows you the the closing prices as well as the factors that could um, affect what the value of that commodity is going to be like. So um, we give you enough information to have a better understanding of what the market is going to be like. And just in terms of mitigating these risks as well, and what we have at Apex are um, commodities backed fixed income instruments. So that way you're able to hedge against um, price volatility risk as well as um, hedging against inflation. All right, what opportunities, you know, are, are there for investors to take advantage of, you know, during this period? Okay, um, as I mentioned from your second question, we are at the start of the trading season, which means that we are still in the harvest season. So um, it would be a good time for you to um, take position. I mean, um, entry and exit into the market is very key, especially within the commodity space. So it would be a good time to come in and um, buy these commodities on the exchange. And um, at Apex Commodities, we provide um, a platform um, known as COMEX, where you can um, trade all of these commodities. And if you're a bit risk averse, um, we have fixed income instruments as well that you can play in. And um, I had mentioned from your first question that um, one of the products that we have is the fair trade um, exchange rate commodity, which we took to market in January and March in September. Um, we're taking that back to market again in December and it's very similar to what you would have with mutual funds. And just for um, listeners that don't understand what mutual funds are, what the exchange traded commodity is, um, it's basically a basket of different commodities that are put in um, and it tracks the underlying performance of the commodities that are in that basket. And we have a, a fund manager that actively manages that portfolio. Um, so we took it to market in January this year. What we are doing this season is taking it to market in December, which means that there's a potential for um, returns to be better than what we saw this year, which was at 24%. Well, we all, we all want uh, more returns. But, but looking at it from a global scale now, do you think uh, commodity prices have peaked or are nearing that peaking stage? Um, commodity prices are still relatively low. Um, what we're starting to see is stakeholders and um, market players mopping up the market. So what we expect to see is that um, prices are going to start rising potentially between um, the first quarter of 2023. So at that point, um, the market has been mopped up. Um, demand, we expect that demand will start to um, overlap supply, and that is when we expect prices to start to rise. And again, with um, the increase in inflation, I know inc inflation is currently at 21%. And um, we've seen the central bank try to curb that by, by increasing um, the monetary policy rate to 16.5. So you're going to see, in fact, what we already started to see this year was um, fund managers moving into the fixed income market. And um, fortunately, what we have at FX Commodities Exchange is um, fixed income instruments that are backed by the commodities that we actually have sitting in our warehouses. So we give you the option to either buy or sell these commodities, um, if that's what you want, on the exchange, or you can invest in um, the fixed income instruments that we have. So we, um, we expect a positive trading season this year. All right. Positive trading season expected. Thank you so much. Uh, that was Zara Dogo, investment manager at Apex Limited. Thank you so much.
It was a pleasure being here. Thank you very much. All right, from one market, let's head to another. We have uh, Anita here to give us details. Another bearish close yesterday, talking about the equities market. Anita, you Good expected this. Good morning, Mike. Zero point two four percent, close yeah. to the zero point two five. Almost, uh, we, still we saw it a Monday. Quarter, a quarter of a percent uh, yeah. decline in the markets. Of course, you saw that last week. We still. The market was still reveling in that 6.9%, um, nearly 7% rally yeah. that, was, um, that dominated the, the market. I think it's now the time for the bears, what you call the profit takers. So it's not whether the market is um, short -lived, uh, though, quite, uh, quite really short -lived. hemorrhaging. Yes, uh, short-lived. Yeah. And I, I think it's mostly because of its, um, uh, the foreign investors, not the local investors. So the foreign investors are the ones who are playing the market at the moment. So uh, there's nothing to worry about. But although we can't see some... Um, respite uh, for, for the market. All but, right. uh, but, but before that, let's get to review how Tuesday's trading session ended at the NGX. Now, this is Tuesday's trading session review for the market, 0.24%. In, in basis, uh, basis points, it's 113.48 basis points. And then in Naira value, what you see here was 61.81 billion Naira knocked off from the to market's total value, that's the total value of equities listed on the Nigerian exchange. And this is re uh, in reaction to uh, profit taking on the likes of uh, Nigerian breweries, uh, the likes of uh, so, so many bank, uh, banking counter majors, the, the tier one lenders in particular. So we had many of the, what we call the Fugas, the First Bank, Union Bank, GT, GT Co, Access Bank, and Zenit Bank. So the effect of that profit taking is what made the market to go down by 2.14%, which is what you see here for the market, as well as the consumer goods sector. That's because of Nigerian breweries had uh, much sell pressure on it. But taking a look at the other side, uh, well, it was fairly a mixed bag for the market. Now, in terms of the activity, the activity, it, it dropped by 56.69%. While value, we had a, actually we had an increase in the value. The value was up by 5.44% in contrast to what you had on Monday. And then in terms of the deals, 20.10% 20 decline for the market. That's it for the for that market. But we, in terms of the uh, the market's uh, market breadth, it was a slightly negative market breadth for the market. We had 13 gainers in contrast to 14 losers. So that's it for that market. So let's flip over to the other uh, smaller unlisted securities market. So there we have it. The bear still have it for that market. It's down by a wider margin this time, 1.27%. And this value for the market, it has dropped all the way from the 1 trillion naira mark to 923.44 billion naira, while the uh, market uh, security index has also dropped to, to that level of more than just about 701 uh, points there. Now, in terms of the volume, the volume there, it had an increase in contrast to what you had on Monday, 961,465 five securities uh, were traded volume. And then in all the deals, it, the deals were nine, while we had the number of stocks that were traded were three. Now, this market, it reacted to profit taking. When you flip over, this was, we had three losers on that market, but the highest was from the, um, the, the, the company formerly called Mobile Nigeria, which is now known as Double One PLC. It was down by 0.65%, which you can see there. Now, take a look at the top trades. U United, uh, UBN, or Union Bank uh, Nigeria property, it had uh, the, the highest number of trades on that uh, counter for that market. Let's move over to the uh, um, unlisted security, on, onto the fixed income mark market where we're talking about. Now, for the bond market, it ended Tuesday session more of on the bearish side after trading mix, and this is because... Uh, the, the, there was much demand for the March 2027 bond, and then the average yield there, the average yield that contracted by one basis point to 14.4%. Now, taking a look at the board there, the total value is 4.79 billion naira, while the highest concentration was on the 27th of March paper 2050. Uh, the price high is still at 97.82. Uh, percent in terms of percentage term, while the total value there was 2.5 billion naira. Moving over to the treasury bills market, for the treasury bills market, it rather traded on the quiet side. The total number of deals carried out there was five, and the total value 18.76 billion naira. Now you can see there, it's almost a tie for these two 
uh, instruments here, this, uh, the 9th of March 2023 paper and the 26th of January 2023 paper. It's a tie there in terms of deals, but in terms of value, 10.36 and 8.16 billion, as you can see on the board there. Now for the OMO market, the OMO market it ended on the flat side, 10.1% is what the OMO uh, um, average yield closed there. But taking a look at the board here, what we have, the, the number of the, the, um, securities traded there, 14 of uh, February 2023, it had the highest concentration, four deals, 14.3 billion, 14 billion naira, that's the total value. But in terms of the market there, the total value there ended at 33.52 billion naira. Moving over to the central bank special bills, the central bank special bills, the only concentration was on the 29th of May for next year, which had just two deals, and then at a small, uh, what, what do I call small number, 870 million naira in terms of value. So that's it for that market. For, for where well, we will be looking out for how the last trading day of um, uh, November turns out for the market. And for, for now, we're still uh, optimistic for a rebound for the market. So last trading day, November, could, Can you be, believe it? could be green. Well, I think, uh, to me, I think uh, there might be some uh, slight respite for the market, particularly the equities market. For the fixed income market, investors are still kind of, um, uh, they're, they're, they're a little bit... They, they, they're taking the time, right? Yes, because of the the yield environment is not too encouraging. So most likely they might shift from the fixed income market into the equities market. That's that's my that's my take. All right, all eyes on the monthly close. Thank you so much, Anita. Right, let's head on to the UK now. We have uh, Juliana standing by right there. So Juliana got that uh, new data there. UK food price inflation new high about 12.4%. Good morning, Laddie. That's right. Another uh, a grim set of data for consumers already grappling with the cost of living crisis in the UK. And that's from the British Retail Consortium pretty much uh, spelling out what most consumers in the UK know, which is that uh, food prices are rising uh, pretty swiftly here in the UK. Um, between last month and November, um, they've risen by about 0.6%, so it's now at about 12.4%. Um, and if you look at fresh food, which is what most households buy, because of course you want to cook fresh, um, they have risen by about 14.6%. And this is the highest um, level of inflation that we've seen since records began in 2005. Mostly this is meat, um, dairy, eggs. There was a shortage of eggs because we are grappling as well uh, with a bird flu crisis. And it does just makes for a pretty bleak Christmas. We know that lots of workers are, you know, planning to down tools in the next couple of days. In fact, we've got a strike on at the moment by Royal Mail because we know wages are not going as far. You couple that with the cost of living crisis, high inflation, high food costs. It is looking like it isn't going to be um, a very bright Christmas for so many because, of course, we know that uh, consumers are going to have to cut back. I think there was... Um, a report by one think tank that suggested about seven in ten people um, are struggling uh, to find out how they're going to pay for their Christmas dinners. Not great, um, and we're hoping that uh, this inflation will start easing uh, soon. Of course, bearing in mind that Bank of England benchmark rate for inflation in this country is at two percent. Um, it's currently at um, 11 year, a 41 year high of above 11 percent, and it doesn't appear as if it will be abating anytime soon. Right. I guess the, the Grinch for this uh, Christmas is, is definitely inflation, you know, at, at this point. And we see more energy suppliers there saying they could go bust this winter, potentially, you know, taking government payments intended for customers with them. Another uh, grim one there. Yeah, this is um, because uh, Chris O'Shea, who is um, the chief executive officer of Centrica, that is the British gas owner, he uh, was given an interview to the Financial Times and some of his uh, pretty bleak statements have been leaked um, across the British media this morning. He's basically saying that, look, you know, uh, from what he is seeing, um, firms are really struggling with cash flow. In fact, he believes some firms are basically trading whilst being bankrupt at the moment. And we've seen it in the past, I would say, three 
years, but certainly since the start of the war um, in Ukraine, about 29 energy firms have gone bust um, in this country. Um, it was a pretty much an open-end market a few years ago, and when there was that shock uh, from what happened in Ukraine, so many of them couldn't survive. And the issue is, um, it does affect consumers. Now, the energy regulator Ofgem is asking people not to be alarmed, because of course, if your energy supplier does go bust, you're automatically moved to one of the big three uh, big ones. But unfortunately, and this is what we saw earlier in the year, some customers have set up direct debits or they've got special dis discounts would have been put in place by the government. They've not been passed on. Or if your um, consumer, your energy supplier uh, falls in a month where you've already paid the direct debit, you may be switched on to another supplier and you have to pay another direct debit. Uh, lots of customers are still waiting uh, for refunds. So it's not great. Um, it does still show that, you know, the energy market is still very, very volatile at the moment. And we, it is getting much, much colder. We had a pretty warm October. It's very, very cold here in the UK at the moment, um, Laddie. It is going to get much more cold and we are going to see uh, more energy firms collapse. Right. Well, Juliana, thank you so much. Well, we're just hoping, you know, for a, a nice Christmas <laughs> at least. Thank you so much, Juliana. Yeah, we deserve it. Yeah. Thank you. All right, there. that was Juliana there giving us the details uh, from the UK. Let's uh, head on to other markets now. We see some uh, green in the uh, crypto space there. We see Bitcoin there getting that big uh, rebound there to about 17,000. Uh, but some uh, traders are saying this might not last, but we're seeing uh, sentiment in the market there, 29 uh, points. Fear, better than extreme fear, that's what we had uh, most of uh, November, we're now at fear, uh, maybe ending a month in fear and getting into uh, December with some greed, hopefully, you know, talking about the crypto sentiment in the market right now. Let's look at the market cap there, $852.68 billion, up 2.12%. We've seen that uptick there. Volume traded, though, down 1.68%, and Bitcoin dominance still sitting at 38 uh, percent there. Let's look at the price of Bitcoin this morning there. $16,856. Uh, there were worries that 16K, you know, wouldn't hold when we saw that downturn in the market, but we're seeing a massive jump there, up 2.36 percent. Volume traded in Bitcoin, $25.45 billion. Let's look at Ethereum there now, $1,267 up uh, 5.21 percent, a bigger mover there uh, from Bitcoin, but we're seeing a low volume, 8.30 uh, billion dollars. Let's bring in uh, uh, Michael Anaji now to bring us up to speed of what's going on with the contagion in the market. Hello, Michael. Hello, Eddie. Good morning. Thanks good, for having me. Good on. morning. Great to have you, uh, Michael. But I saw that uh, headline this morning. It said, why are crypto lenders blowing up right now? Why is this happening, uh, Michael? But the simple reason for the uh, crypto lenders blowing up is a simple word. It's called a rehypercation. Re uh, basically, um, rehypercation. Uh, and it's basically what it is is uh, fun, um, funds rehypercate uh, the funds that are managed for other people. And simply what that means is um, you, you, you lend out money that you simply don't have. So you have one-to-one uh, -one deposit, and instead of instead of lending what you have on your balance sheet, you lend what you don't have, and you just create fractional money. You create money that you don't have, like similar to what we have in the banking system. And so when you have these uh, companies basically do this, um, you had um, Celsius. Celsius, they did this by um, basically, it almost was, borderline a Ponzi scheme, you brought in new investors, uh, you sell your uh, sell token, and you basically use it as a marketing expense in order to prop up the ridiculous returns that were, they were promising. And also similar to what we saw with FTX imploding, uh, a lot of the time uh, in crypto and in the traditional financial system, the reason why people blow up is because simply they don't have enough liquidity on hand to meet their obligation. And so, unfortunately, uh, this this has come into crypto. Um, and so, what's needed to stamp it out is strange like regulation. But it's unfortunate that this actually does happen in crypto because, at the end of the day, uh, crypto was created as an immutable ledger. Especially Bitcoin was created as an immutable ledger. 
um, that was supposed to basically be uh, one to one. Um, that was supposed to be a system where you could see um, basically every single transaction on the blockchain. Uh, it's sad that we, you know, it's come to this. I, I think most people recognize that in 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 Bitcoin world that uh, people who want to borrow your Bitcoin, who want to lend it out, um, that's usually involved with a high amount of risk. Um, and the, I think there's a saying that goes, a good way to part a Bitcoiner with their Bitcoin is with leverage. And so anytime you you introduce leverage into the system, you tend to be, get people get washed out. And so I think it goes against the ethos of Bitcoin. Uh, a lot of this like leverage trading, we've realized now that, you know, it, at the end of the day, if you, if you give out your Bitcoins, you might not get them back. So at the end of the day, um, we've seen even Genesis uh, fail. Um, so because Genesis is one of the biggest lending desks, uh, prime brokerage desks in crypto. And so if they're, if they're able to fail and have a $1 billion hole in their balance sheet, who's safe? Really nobody is safe. So the best thing to do in crypto is not your keys, not your coin. Crypto is big, Bitcoin is all about self custody. And so, you know, when you introduce leverage, you simply just pervert the entire sense of the ethos of why Satoshi Nakamoto founded if you look in the first block of Bitcoin, it says the, the chancellor has built up more banks. And it talks about basically how this system of froth, the system of, of decay, where people lend out money in a fractional reserve system simply won't work. And so you have to introduce a, a, you know, a new system that's counter to that. And some people along the way lost that original ethos and those values. And so, you know, people also lose, you know, money at the same time. But 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 we yeah. got that news that the FTX hacker has mobilized the stolen uh, Ethereum again. What can we expect from this? It's funny because the FTX hacker is most likely an employee from FTX, according to Sam Backman Freed, or he is it's an it's an employee who had malware on his computer. I personally think the FTX hackers, someone Sam knows, uh, and probably let do this as a way of, you know, having more funds to give them a, a chance to resurrect their falling entity. Um, so uh, the FTX hackers, it's, it's probably an inside job. I, I really don't believe someone came in and maliciously took away their coins because, you know, at the end of the day, they were doing so much fraud that they had access to all the private keys it was such a tight circle. I don't really think that those coins really disappeared like how he's saying. Uh, there's some there's some fraud in, in what they're saying about this FTX hacker. It's going to come out to light eventually that it, it's not what he's saying it is, um, just because of how private keys work. I don't know. If this person had the keys to the, those wallets, they would have been in on the original fraud. So it's probably amongst his inner circle that is doing um, the hack. But at the end of the day, I don't think it's going to have that much impact to the market because um, at this point, this is one of the best times in crypto in terms of risk reward. The look, what we go down 50% from here and go to eight, go to eight K. But at the end of the day, that's not, that doesn't represent a huge risk. I think right now is when you may make those value buys that you can hold for the next two, three, a year. Um, I think the risk reward here for Bitcoin is 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 very good. Um, yeah, we could go lower, but if you're a value investor and you're looking um, for uh, a, a solid place to buy every single metric right. on every every single metric, it points to it being a good buy. This is the highest minor minor capitulation we've ever had. Uh, the last one we had that, that was this high was when we were at two hundred and ninety dollars, and when we were about a, at a dollar. Okay. Um, it's, the miners have never been distressed. You've seen mining companies going bust in terms of the crypto mining companies. A lot of them have gone bust. A lot of their debts are trading for basically um, negative. I'm um, sorry, basically cents on the dollar, implying that they're going to go bankrupt. Okay. Even Coinbase's debt. If you look at Coinbase's uh, bond. It's trading for 54 cents on the dollar, playing the market thinks they're going to go belly up too. So it's never been a more fearful time in the market. Right. And also at that, uh, if you're looking at long-term buys, I think everything that's you know, it, that's like a DAX, everything that's 
some right. sh- that is decentralized. It's, it's a screaming buy now at this point. All right, Michael. Can we go lower? Yeah, we could go down 50, 60, 70% more, but yeah, at the risk of what? Missing the next, you know, 10x, 5x, okay. it's, it, it doesn't really pan out anymore. All right, Michael. So now, well, I, I guess, uh, I guess uh, also another thing is, you know, having money to also buy the dip because uh, retail, <laughs> retail has been hammered, you know, this season. Well, thank you so much, Michael and Naji, financial market analyst. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Larry. All right, that's it on the markets, and that's a wrap on the program. Don't forget to join us by 1.30 on Business Incorporated for more updates and developments in the world of business. And you can watch this again on our YouTube uh, channel there. Just flip over to YouTube, search for Channel Television, flip to our videos, you can watch all our productions. Thank you for watching. I'm Ladi Williams. Bye for now.